Uh, well, thank you all very much for the honor of this invitation. It's been lovely getting to know some of the colleagues here uh, at uh, Xu Yen and also to see your lovely campus. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is something that I thought would, would resonate with many of you because I happen to know that all of you, I'm presuming, in the room today are bilingual and that will make this a little more interesting. And uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, one of the big issues facing testing right now and psychology more generally is that we are mo moving tests around um, the country, around the world really. And so uh, what I'm going to do is talk about um, how this happens, how this uh, process of taking tests from one language and culture to another uh, works. I'm going to give you an overview of the whole process of test adaptation, talk a little bit about its history, and then give you some examples. And I think the examples will make some of the issues uh, very clear. And I have given these slides um, to Joseph, and so he can, he can share them if, if he would like later. First, I think it's, it's self-evident to everybody that the world is shrinking. Uh, we can watch news all over the world and find out what's happening in Indonesia right now. We can uh, know, uh, unfortunately, what's happening in the United States politics uh, all over the world. Uh, and many comparisons are happening uh, across of countries on lots of issues. Uh, we have many shared concerns like climate change and so forth. I also think psychological science is getting much stronger, which allows us to believe in some global issues facing psychology. Uh, also, I can tell you, I graduated my doctoral degree in 1977, and I think it would be fair to say I never heard the word culture once in five years in graduate school at two different graduate schools. Now, psychologists can talk about culture and cultural differences uh, in ways that are meaningful. Uh, I think our, our uh, theories now include culture, and uh, we talk about the differences between etic and emic. Is, are those terms familiar to people? Yeah, good, okay. Uh, and there are also fiscal and pragmatic reasons why many people are converting tests from one language and culture to another. Uh, it's usually cheaper to do that, and if the test is developed like the big five um, or the NEO-PI, something like that, has been developed in one uh, culture, it's easy to translate that or, or adapt it so that it goes to a second culture and usually uh, quite a bit cheaper to do that than to build a, a new test entirely. Uh, some of the issues that we need to consider when we're taking a test from one language and culture to another is that they are in different languages. And, and I think historically, when first people started doing this, they only thought about translation. They didn't think about anything else. Then people started saying, well, we have to take cultural considerations into account and geographic and some other considerations. And I'll, I'll give you some examples toward the end of the talk on that. And we have to renorm the test and revalidate the test. And it's even possible sometimes within the same culture, you might have to build it for two languages. Uh, I actually gave a keynote in, in Mexico a few years ago and it turns out in Mexico, there are something like 30 indigenous populations, all with different languages. And they've made the decision that they're going to educate every indigenous population in their home language, in their original cultural language, and they're going to test them in their original cultural language. Now, what's interesting about that is half of the languages were not even ri ever written. So the first step that Mexico had to do was to convert uh, all those languages to writing so that they could educate people in those languages. And they've had real trouble finding teachers in some of the indigenous languages, and so they've had to vary educational backgrounds and so forth. Uh, South Africa is doing very similarly. Now, in the United States, we assume everyone wants to learn English, and so we're doing it a different way. I actually like the Mexico approach better, although what's interesting is um, that many of the parents of indigenous peoples in Mexico want to be sure that their children speak Spanish because that's where the jobs will be. And so there's a lot of issues in this uh, idea of um, going across languages. And I, I did study abroad, by the way, as an undergraduate myself. I spent a year in Europe. Now, 
Um, I'm not going to tell you the article I'm proudest of, but the article that has gotten about a thousand citations now that I wrote in 1994 was really the first comprehensive article that talked about adapting tests across languages. Uh, it was published in Psychological Assessment, and you can see here the title of it, uh, Cross-Cultural Normative Assessment, Translation and Adaptation Issues Influencing the Normative Interpretation of Assessment Instruments. I'm going to talk about some of the points in that article today, but I'm going to update it quite a bit. I will also tell you subsequent to that, um, the International Test Commission um, publishes guidelines for translating and adapting tests. Um, they first did it in 2005, and then they came out with another set in 2017. And those are both free freely available at the website at the bottom of that page. Um, it's sort of a weird website, but it, when you see 16 at the end and all, but nevertheless, they're all freely available for download and sharing um, there, which is really the way science should work, but doesn't always. Um, the, the, the way those guidelines read is we talk about context, test development and adaptation, administration, documentation, score interpretation, and diff studies. Diff studies are differential item functioning. That's how you see if the item is behaving the same across different cultures and languages. Uh, the ITC is an organization of psychological associations primarily. Uh, for many, many years, it started in the 60s. It was uh, originally founded in Europe because each European country had somebody in charge of testing for that country, in usually running, um, working for the psych department, perhaps as a volunteer to their psych department, and they wanted to get together to talk about issues that they shared. And so uh, our main members are actually psychological associations all over the world, uh, some 70 psychological associations right now. They also have now company membership, so a test publisher can join, and we have individual members as well. Uh, our goals are to promote good practice and test adaptation and testing generally, assure the uniformity of quality of tests being adapted for use in other cultures and languages, um, and trying to get more national resources um, into good testing, especially in emerging and developing nations. So we spend a fair amount of money um, sending people to conferences in developing nations to talk about uh, better ways to do testing and so forth. Uh, I note that the first major book uh, published in this area is this one. It was edited by um, three people. Um, at least one name some of you will have heard of, Ronald Hamilton, Peter uh, Miranda, and Charles Spielberger. Well, Charles Spielberger was very famous for doing the state trade anxiety inventory as well as some others. Uh, Hamilton is an educational testing person, and Miranda was a psychometrician. I have a chapter in that based on uh, uh, work that I did with a dissertation student um, on the first Spanish uh, intelligence test built for Puerto Rico, and there were lots of problems in that um, first test, which was being marketed by one of the big psychological testing companies in the United States. But basically, to give you a, a quick example of how poorly it was done, uh, the first test that you were supposed to give in the intelligence test was a vocabulary test, which sets the limits for about where the person is. They simply took the English language words from the Wexler Adult Intelligence Test, translated them to Spanish. Now, in English, they are rank ordered in terms of easiest to hardest, but once they translated them, there was no relationship to difficulty at all, and they just left them in the original order. So uh, we've come a long way since that time. Uh, it was also normed very poorly with a way over representation of rural people as opposed to urban people from the city of, from the island of Puerto Rico and so forth. Uh, and so it, it led to scores for, uh, and the student, the, the chapter that I have based on his dissertation um, showed that students who were equally language proficient in both languages and who lived usually both in the United States and Puerto Rico, as there's a lot of people that go back and forth, actually scored 20 to 25 points higher on the Spanish version. I mean, that's like almost two standard deviations higher than they did on the English language version. And this is after they were tested to be shown to have equal language proficiency. Uh, I co-edited this international, um, the ITC International Handbook on Testing and Assessment, and it has a chapter on test adaptation by Fons van de Wever, 
who's a Dutch slash Belgium psychologist who's done some of the best cross-cultural work. I think he's president of the Cross-Cultural Psych Association right now. Uh, it also has a chapter on ITC guidelines and standards written by Dave Bartram uh, and Ron Hamilton. And, and since it was mentioned that I'm president of the ITC, uh, I can also um, tell you that I, can't, I can only go back some, but just tell you how international that is as an organization. We met here in 2000 uh, at the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, at that point, John Hattie from uh, Australia was the president. He was followed by Fanny Chung, who's at the Chinese University of Hong Kong uh, as president. Then uh, David Bartram from Great Britain, followed by Dragos Iliuscu from Romania, and now me from the United States. So that's really not dominated by any, any country at all, which is really a nice, nice thing to do. Uh, and actually, the first full book on adapting tests has come out. Drago Siliuscu, my predecessor and friend, um, published this as part of an ITC book series, Adapting Tests in Linguistic and Cultural Situations. And I must tell you, I have the book at home. I've read the first three chapters. It just came out this summer, and I think my travels have gotten in the way uh, since then. Now, I'm going to do two precursors here. If you have any interest in publishing tests at all uh, that are taken from another language or another culture, uh, the first thing to say is to get permission from the copyright holder. So in other words, if this is a copyrighted test, don't just start translating it. Write them and ask for permission to do so. Uh, and I'm going to come back to a story that appeared in Science where I was interviewed recently. Um, and even if it's not published or copyrighted, um, and sometimes they appear in journal articles or whatnot, I would write the author and, and ask for permission. It's just good courtesy. Um, but there was an article in Science I got interviewed for. I didn't know anything about it. But this psychologist who had retired from San Diego State University had developed a measure um, related in health psychology to see if people were compliant with their medicines and medical regimens that they've been given. Only eight questions translated into some 57 languages and so forth and, and related to many, many different diseases. They had some specialized like for diabetes and heart problems and so forth. Well, what happened, he retired, he published it. It was mostly being used by insurance companies to decide whether they were gonna continue funding people or not. Uh, and so some graduate students around the country wanted to use it for their theses or dissertations. Now, I, there's a, graduate students in the audience. I don't want to say something demeaning to anybody. But what happened is graduate students would write him and say, can I use your measure? And two weeks later, he hadn't replied because he was retired after all. And so they used it anyhow. And he got mad and sent them all bills for like $5,000. Now, I got asked, is that legitimate? And the answer is, it is legitimate. If someone uses a copyright, and that the, when I said that, the, the person interviewing me was aghast and said, how can that be? It's not fair. And I said, oh, I think it's crazy, but it's legal. You know, I said, I would never charge a student like that. I don't think that's appropriate to charge a student like that. But if it's copyrighted, you know, I can't take a novel and take it to a copy machine and copy it and make multiple copies and sell them to people myself or give them away. So anyhow, these are, I, 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 I say more on this than it's really worth, but I say it to impress on people that if, if you're using a test from another language and you're translating it, let's say, into Cantonese here to use for a study, please get permission first. Uh, please um, don't put yourself in a bad position. And it's, and frankly, doing this as an ethics issue, at least in the American Psychological Association, doing copy, taking something that's copyrighted and using it yourself is an ethics violation. So it could get you in a lot of trouble. Now, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, if, if you're going to adopt a test, you have to decide for what purpose. You have to look at the implications in terms of research and do you have the training to administer it and um, what are the psychometric properties, including validity, and if it's available already in another language. And so, for example, when the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory 
was brought to China, there were four or five language versions that were, uh, several people translated it. I think Fanny Chung's version is the one that's now um, lasted, but she's also developed the Chinese personality inventory. And so those are both measures, and I'll, I'll come back to why I think the latter is probably the better test, but, but we now check to see at Burroughs whether tests are available in different languages, and we, we have a publication that lists that. Uh, I note, and I have this for Europe, I don't have it for China, but to give you a sense of the extent to which tests are translated, um, two, two colleagues, uh, Paula Alosio, who's from um, Spain, and Dragos Iliuscu, they published a survey of the result, uh, well, they published the results of a survey of the 10 most commonly used psychological measures in Europe, and of those, eight of them come from the United States in translation, uh, and the two that didn't, that came from Europe, were the Raven's Progressive Matrices, which is basically um, a mostly nonverbal test, uh, and the Rorschach, which is also a nonverbal test. So, uh, so this is how much right now tests are being uh, adapted into to different cultures and languages. And I've given you some examples of the, the tests, the Wexler Test of Intelligence, and that's all three of them uh, for different age groups, the MMPI, the 16PF, and the NEOPI. Those are all personality inventories. Now, why would you adapt? And I've just listed here quickly, I'm gonna go through this really fast. But some of the pros for doing a test adaptation is that the test is established and recognized in other settings, that it's cheaper to, to translate than build a new, um, that global, globalization necessitates uh, cross-culturally appropriate measures um, to fulfill the need to compare, evaluate, select, treat, and so on. And guidelines and best practice research offer more options to test users to make informed decisions to reduce negative outcomes. I would also say lots of times it's people like Fanny who was tr um, educated at the University of Minnesota where the MMPI was um, developed. She knew how to use it there and so forth and so then when she came to the United, uh, when she came back to China she, she was uh, familiar to adapt it. The cons are that there are copyright issues and country membership requirements. Um, there's a question of whether the benefits uh, justify the efforts and if there's a real need to assess or participate. So I'm sure some tests like the NEOPI have been translated into Chinese. However, one of the things that Fanny found out is that the big five that works um, so well in Western cultures doesn't work as well in China where there needs to be a sixth factor that, that's sort of a communal orientation or a, or a group orientation. Uh, which doesn't seem to work in the Western cultures, but works here in the East. Um, third, there are fairness and validity issues. Um, like we have some tests that may or not may, may not be fair to some groups within the United States, but if you take them into a new culture, it's not clear whether the knowledge is commonly known, for example, or the uh, information is commonly um, known in the new culture. Uh, and translated assessments, even with adaptation, um, can introduce some um, negative psychometric and cross-cultural issues. And a little example I can give you of that, the, the primary uh, college admissions measure in the United States is the SAT. And the SAT uh, for is given all over the English-speaking world, at least the United States English-speaking world, and it's given in the Caribbean. And back in the 1960s, um, there was a reading test um, section, and the reading tests, as I'm sure you all know, are usually several paragraphs of text followed by some multiple choice questions that ask you what you've comprehended. And in this particular case, they had a section on ice skating. And so in the Caribbean, uh, it, the, the waters don't freeze very often, and the students didn't know anything about ice skating. Now they have some winter sports, they appear, you know, appear in the Winter Olympics and all, but back in the 60s they didn't know that. And so there were huge differences in their performance because they, didn't lack, uh, they lacked the requisite knowledge to be even begin to comprehend um, the, the paragraphs and the, and the section. Uh, some other issues why people are adapting measures. Um, some of you may know the OECD, that's the Organization for Economic 
for Operation and Development. It's based out of Paris, and they've been doing um, comparisons of science, mathematics, critical thinking, engineering, and economics. Uh, the, the science and mathematics are known the best. Um, that's um, PISA and TIMS are their, how they're referred to. They're cross-cultural comparisons of, of, across countries. Uh, I worked on the critical thinking, and I'm going to give you some examples of that later in the talk um, that will make very clear how difficult some of these issues are. I've already mentioned this Mexican model and the South African model, but we also live in a world with really increasing immigration and diversity. And I think uh, that makes for some real issues where you have to test people uh, in different ways. Uh, now, why not adapt? I've, I've mentioned some of these. I, I've again mentioned the big five and big six. Um, sometimes the mode of measurement doesn't make sense. You may know in the British system, they were not familiar at all with multiple choice tests up until the last 15 years or so. I don't know if that was true in Hong Kong or not, but they did all essay tests in England and so uh, throughout the school system. So when people started taking multiple choice tests there, you have a real sense of what, how do I do this? What is this? Whereas some cultures, you've had that for years. Uh, okay, and I've talked about Emic and Edit. Now, Van der Weyver, who I mentioned earlier, he says there's three equivalents foci for test adaptation, and he also points out that these have happened historically, that at first, we looked at language equivalents. We just tried to translate it and see what happened, how similar it was across languages. Then we started saying, okay, well, we have to deal with culture and cultural issues. And finally, we went to psychometric um, equivalents. And now there's a, lo a whole lot of procedures for psychometric equivalents. Uh, I'm not gonna get into them. I didn't think that would open up um, enough people uh, would, would understand some of the stuff. But uh, We've all probably encountered, and certainly in the United States, we make fun of this from time to time, uh, companies that have made products and then they sell them in another country and they use Google Translate to do the instructions or something, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And so uh, we have to, um, to do better than that. Um, we currently use the term adaptation rather than translation. Uh, because we do want people to deal with the cultural issues as well as the language issues. And when you say translation, it sounds like it's just language. Uh, let's see. I think that's good. Uh, now, there's t different kinds of ways of doing translation and adaptation. Uh, as I said, translation refers to only language. We can do the simple translation. Uh, we can do adaptation with translation checks, meaning people are reviewing it. Uh, the first of these was written up in 1970, um, and I'm drawing a blank on the psychologist's name, who, who came, um, John, John Brislin, um, came up with this notion of back translation. Now, there are still some people tell you back translation is a technique of choice. I'm gonna tell you it's outdated and wrong. Uh, and, and there's a simple, I can explain this really simply. In back translation, what it is, is you hire one person to translate the test from one language to another, then you hire somebody else to translate it back to the original language. The idea being, if the second one is similar to the original version, then you say, well, the, the first translation to the target language from the original language must have been a good one because we translate it back. The problem is, if you're hiring translators who know they're gonna be evaluated on the basis of how good the translation is translated back, they don't use the optimal language in the first, in the first translation. Instead, they use a language so that it will be translated back appropriately. And that's not what you want. You want it translated in to make the most sense in the new language, in the target language. Um, you can also ask experts to go through and evaluate step by step now, this was something that for many years, just like Fanny Chung doing it with the MMPI, it was done by one person. I'm gonna argue that usually you need a team to do it, that the skills involved are more than what one person's likely um, to bring. I think I've made that argument in the literature. 
And there's also something uh, that's being used for some international educational comparisons now called the multiple concurrent development of assessments, which is really not the same thing as adaptation. That's where you're building all the tests for all the countries at the same time. And that's, that's really hard. Uh, I mean, it's, it makes sense for doing those educational comparisons, although you can still run into some problems. I'll give you an example of that later. So what are the skills needed to adapt and measure? First, you have to be fluent in both languages, truly fluent. You have to have a comprehensive understanding of the construct or constructs that you're measuring. You have to have a thorough understanding of both cultures. And I note you have to understand the extent to which those constructs hold in both cultures because they may or may not hold, just like the communal orientation doesn't hold in the, in, the, in the West the way it does in the East. And you have to have some experience and ability working on tests and measures, such as item writing and, and even writing instructions. I saw a test where in English the instructions were maybe two or three lines on how to take the test, and in French it was almost a whole page. So that's different. Um, what do you want the test to look? You want the item difficulty to be more or less the same across um, languages and cultures. And that's certainly true with intelligence and, and educational tests. You want there to be content relevance and access. And there's where I give you the Caribbean ice skating example. You want to know that the construct is relevant and valid in both languages. And then you want more or less similar formatting and appearance and comparable tasks. Now. I talked about this. This is uh, the concurrent assessment model used by OECD. It's not usually an adaptation approach, and it doesn't uh, work for pre-existing measures. I've talked about why back translation is not. I do this all the time, by the way. I'm sorry to say. But when I go over the slides and over the slides and over the slides, then I start giving the information prior to when they were really supposed to come. And that's on me. I apologize. So I'm going to give you the example of a back-translated item. There was an analogy question where the stem was out of sight, out of mind. That's a, an American expression. I don't know if any of you have heard it before. Um, as my, I get older and my memory gets worse, it's, it's more and more true. But what this means is if you're not looking at something, you forget about it. Okay? So that was the stem of an analogy question. Now that got translated and back translated. And what came back was blind insane. Okay? That's very different. And actually, I've heard that there was a second back translation just to see, and it came back as invisible insane. So there's a situation where some things just don't work very well, uh, and you wouldn't want to count on that. And then Fanny Chung uses an MMPI question um, where some of these concepts just don't go. There's an American expression, I feel blue. Now, I happen to know that also works in French. Blue means depressed. But it must not work in some languages. You know, and imagine, what does I feel red mean or I feel yellow? You know, I'm not sure what that, any of those uh, mean. And you have to avoid colloquial expressions uh, um, I worked with a psychologist, it's funny, I'm toward the end of my career now, but I worked with her from when she was about 65 to about 78 or so. A very famous uh, American psychologist, Ann Anastasi. And she had a lot of, in her files, old intelligence tests from like 1918, 1920. And they often had things that were colloquial expressions in English that they said, what does that mean? Now if you were trying to build cultural bias into it, that would be a really good way to do it. Like I remember one of them was a stitch in time saves nine. Now first off, have any of you ever heard that, a stitch in time saves nine? Okay. What that means is if you've got a pair of pants with a hole developing, if you sew it now, that will mean you have to do less stitches down the line. And more broadly, it means if you do something early to fix a problem, it stops it from getting bigger. Now, if you heard that expression all your life as a child, that would mean something to you. But if you never had heard that, 
like if you came from another country to the United States, that would be a big problem. Uh, in international adaptations, what we found is the quality of adaptations and translations has a direct influence on the actual comparability and the validity of scores that result from tests. It's not surprising. Uh, and if an instrument is adapted well, the psychometric properties of the instrument should not change appreciably, even if the populations are somewhat different. Now, yeah, that's something that's always an empirical question, but that's a general um, finding. It comes out of one of my colleagues, Kadria Ursakan, from the University of British Columbia. Uh, now, obviously, you want people who are bilingual. Um, in Canada, now Canada is a country that has two official languages. So what they do is they build tests for both languages. Now, I was an expert witness in two cases. I represented the Union of Canadian Employees in Canada. This is back in the 80s, early 80s, mid-80s. And they were concerned about some other issues. And so what I'm going to tell you was not something they were particularly concerned about. But as I was looking at data, I found out that the French did about 3% to 4%, 5% at worst, worse than the English-speaking people. So when you looked at the jobs that were coming out from civil service tests, the English people, English speaking people were much more likely to get jobs than the French speaking people. And one of the issues was all of their item writers were English. They were all writing the tests in English and then they were being translated into French. So when I raised the issue, they said to me, oh, the French schools are not as good as the English schools. That's the problem. I said, I bet it's because they're being translated from English to French. Now, I only found this out 10 years later. They, we didn't get too into that issue. But 10 years later, one of the people I met who used to work for the Canadian government no longer did. And he told me, we all knew you were right, but we couldn't admit it publicly. So uh, these, are, these are real issues. And they have real impacts when you start saying people aren't getting jobs. Um, we also have word choice issues uh, that, that, and syntax, unequal length, on, I've mentioned that before, and different contextual meaning of, of vocabulary. Those are all issues that affect. Um, we really need to always screen tests both logically by reviewers and then empirically with data to see how well we think they're being adapted. Uh, we have techniques. In, in testing called differential item functioning, or DIFF. Uh, it used to be called item bias, and we've gone to the term DIFF because it's a little more neutral sounding. Uh, but this is looking at how items uh, are similar empirically across the two, two versions. Now, usually they're used, let's say, in the United States between men and women. You can see how men and women do on an item and see if there's, if there's a problem that they don't do equivalently. And it takes into account ability differences and so forth. Well, uh, there was a, a movement in the 90s to say we should be doing diff on all the items that are translated. The problem is, as has been pointed out by one of my former students, is that the, you have two, two issues going on. And so you can't identify, is it a poor translation? You have group differences in terms of the ability across countries, and you have um, the items being in two different languages. And with that confounding, you can't separate out and say oh, it's the translation, because it could be true ability differences across the cultures. Now let's just say a few things about culture. And this is much less easy to see sometimes um, than language. Uh, we need to know how this affects, this affect using the same tests in different countries that use the same language. And I'm going to give you some examples in just a couple minutes. Now, in the 1994 article that I wrote, I had 10 steps for translating and adapting uh, a measure. And I'm going to go through them really fast. And the first one sounds like the whole project. It's to translate and adapt the measure. Well, that's, that's not the easy part. but it, Now, then you have to review it thoroughly. Then you have to revise the measure based on comments and suggestions provided in that review. 
then you pilot the instrument. Now by piloting, I'm talking about you give it to six people that you know that can take the test. Not that you try to go out and get a great sample or something like that. You're doing it and talking to people usually about, you're interviewing them, what worked, what didn't work, what made sense, what didn't make sense. Then you field test it where you actually are trying to get a, a reasonably good representative sample um, to see how it's working. And then you standardize the scores. Then you perform validation research as needed because you don't want to give a measure that hasn't been validated. I know that there are some people that have done this and there are some companies that have marketed tests in new cultures that have never been validated. They just validate them in the original and assume they're valid in the second country. Then you have to develop the ma manual and or other documents for users of the assessment. You have to train users and then collect reactions from users. And I note here my friend um, Ersakan in, in a book that I edited had another set of steps that's comparable. Uh, I know the book's on the campus because I've seen it. Now, shortly after I wrote that, of course, my good friend Ron Hamilton said that I left out a few steps. So I'm going to, that, that happens. That's the way knowledge works. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with all of them in a sense that I think they, they're subsumed in the things I said, but they, they said you have to hire appropriate translators. I think that's part of the translation process myself, but you have to ensure construct equivalence, and I actually do agree with that. You have to decide whether to adapt or build a new. Well, I think that precedes the steps, in my opinion. And then you have to link scores across. And I'm going to argue linking scores across may or may not be something that's possible. When I show you some examples, I think you're going to agree with me that linking, that means equating, putting them on the same scale so they have equal meaning, is something um, that may not uh, hold. Uh, and lastly, uh, if the test does not have simple right-wrong answers, you have to check the scoring very carefully. Like essay tests that have rubrics for scoring, that has to all be translated and adapted too. And those are, those are um, that's another issue that I hadn't thought about before. Uh, when you adapt a, a test to a new culture and country, I think you need documentation. And that may be a manual, that's what, was what we always had traditionally, but it could also be articles in a website, things like that. You have to document everything you do. We have these standards for educational and psychological testing in the United States. Three professional organizations, including the American Psychological Association, published them. And they have one standard that says, when a test is translated and adapted from one language to another, test developers and or test users are responsible for describing the methods used in establishing the adequacy of the adaptation and documenting empirical or logical evidence for the validity of test score interpretation for intended use. Pretty clear, I mean, that there has to be documentation. I would argue there's some qualitative steps you have to do before it's used. You have to have reviews of the assessment for usability, reviews of that against the original measure for comparability, pretest I've already mentioned. Timing is a big issue across cultures. There are some cultures that are very time oriented and some cultures that are not. I grew up, um, my, my heritage is German, uh, and I am very time oriented. I have uh, different watches for every day of the week if I want. Uh, and when I studied in Germany in college for a year, I was standing on a train platform shortly after getting there and they announced that the train would be two minutes late. Now, in the United States, a train that's two minutes late is early. And, and, and uh, there are real differences, and, and uh, I will also tell you if you go to some Hispanic cultures, uh, the sense of time is, is simply not very important at all. In fact, there's a term called the mañana complex, which means mañana is the word for tomorrow in Spanish, that why do something today if you can do it tomorrow, you know? And so, there are real differences in terms of timing, and you have to think about that uh, in terms of uh, any kind of timing of a measure, the, how appropriate the, the instructions are, because as I said, there are different ex experiential levels with different kinds of tests. Um, lots of cultures haven't gotten computers to the extent that you all have yet, uh, for example. 
um, in developing nations and so forth, they may not have much computer access. Uh, we're talking about tests all going to tablets, and yet there are some places that, that have not had a lot of access on tablets. And then you have to look at the appropriateness. Um, what kinds of research do you need to do after the adaptation? Check the reliability in, in the appropriate way. Check item analysis, sometimes factor analyses of the items. And then secondarily, validation of scores and inferences, um, pr probably using structural equation modeling. Uh, fairness analyses, if appropriate. Um, developing norms and, and perhaps linking. Those are all things that need to be done empirically. Now, beyond validity, you have to think about usefulness. Is the test going to be useful? And I have a really great example um, that shows you could have construct equivalence, but cultural differences dictate different possibilities. Now, the United States has had the SAT probably since the early 50s. That's when the companies were put together. I don't know exactly when it started, but the companies, the college board was founded about that time and started building the SAT. Canada decided it wanted an SAT. So ETS, the company that builds the SAT, worked with Canada to build a Canadian SAT. And for about five to eight years in the late 60s, they did that. And they built it, and they pre-tested it, and it worked. And it predicted performance in college pretty well, as well as it does the SAT in the United States. Now, in the United States, that project is funded by students. The students have to pay to take the test. I assume that's how it is in China for your admissions tests? No? Well, Canada said no. If the universities want the scores, they have to pay. Well, most universities are fairly tight on their budgets. And the idea that a university is suddenly going to pay millions of dollars, literally, to get admissions test scores. They just said, no, we're not. And so even though they had developed the test, it was never used operationally. That's a cultural difference in terms of where culture, the Canada, Canadians saw education. They thought this shouldn't be borne by the students. Um, we talk about test translation errors as a lack of equivalence between the source language version and the target language version of items. Uh, Willie Solano Flores. Uh, has written a whole book on that. Um, but during to the nature of languages, um, you're never going to capture everything probably in, from the original language. And there are also psychometric uh, errors that usually develop if the adapted version is not that equivalent, or the constructs differ. We talk about having equivalence of constructs, that you need that before you start doing it, then equivalence of tests, and also equivalence of testing conditions. So you want to test people in the same manner uh, across cultures, and that may be very different. In rural countries, it may be very possible to take tests in a quiet environment. That may be much harder in some urban environments. Um, we, we note that some adaptation errors occur um, due to cultural, uh, curricular differences, cultural biases, and translation errors. Um, and I talked about that Cerisi study on DIFF uh, before. Uh, fairness analysis, what groups, we call certain groups in the United States, African Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, in some cases women and so forth, we call them underserved groups. Um, they're underrepresented groups. Um, those groups are going to differ by culture. So if you go to some Western European countries, it's going to be perhaps Eastern Europeans that are the underserved groups. And so you have to know who are the underserved groups. I think gender comparisons should almost always be done just to be assured that uh, there are not uh, unplanned cultural, uh, cultural slash uh, gender differences. Now, I'm going to give you some examples. We're moving in testing at times. It goes back and forth toward what we call performance assessments. These are tests that are much more based on um, students actually behaving as they do as students, not doing multiple choice tests, but writing essays, for example, or doing a science experiment and writing up the results. Now, there's a measure that's used at over a 1,000 universities and colleges in the United States called the Collegiate Learning Assessment. Our accreditation agencies require that we demonstrate 
that students are learning what they're supposed to be learning. To be accredited, you have to demonstrate that. I don't know if you have that in, in China um, or, or here in Hong Kong. And this is called the Collegiate Learning Assessment. When I was a vice president, we actually used that at one of the schools. And when I got to Nebraska, they were using it. And to give you a sense of what the, the CLA or the uh, uh, Collegiate Learning Assessment is, uh, <clears throat> it is a, a measure of critical thinking. And I mentioned the latest uh, study done by the OECD is called AHILO, which stands for the Assessment of Higher Education Learning Outcomes. And it was done across economics, engineering, and critical thinking, as they were believed to be the three kinds of skills that drive the economic viability of a country that's a developing country in particular. And Burroughs was hired to perform adaptations of one item on the CLA that was used internationally for comparisons uh, and we did it for North South Korea, Slovakia, Egypt, and Colombia. It had been done for some other countries previously, and I'll come back to that. Uh, was, and th we reviewed uh, results from Kuwait, for example. Now, to give you a sense of the CLA, you read three or four pages of a problem. So reading is involved. And then you have to write an essay solving that problem. And so it's a very applied kind of problem that involves the kind of skills that we want our college students to develop. It involves critical thinking. It does not have a right answer, per se. And they picked a question that had worked very well in the United States. It had to do with the fact you had two, a situation they had drawings to. You have two lakes and you have a river in the middle. And the idea is that the electric power company wants to put in a dam so they can develop some hydroelectric power. But there's also an endangered fish that lives only in this river. So you've got some environmental concerns, you've got power concerns, and so the, the bottom line is you've been hired by the electric company that wants to do this as a consultant and you're supposed to give them advice on what they should do. Okay? It sounds like a pretty good problem in my mind. Um, and the company obviously wants to make a uh, profit. So we worked with teams of educators in each of those different countries. Uh, we were required to sign off on their adaptation. So the team of educators would meet in the different countries, develop their, their question, uh, develop their translation, and then they would gather some data and we would look through the data and look at the translation. Uh, not that we had anybody in my office that speaks Slovakian, for example. Uh, uh, and we had to approve it before it could be used in, as part of the um, HILO project. So let me start with Slovakia. They had almost no problems at all. It was a reasonably easy translation or adaptation. They are, after all, a quasi-Western nation, a NATO country. So they, they get along with Britain and the United States and so forth. I don't know if you know Slovakia, but they sp it's Czechoslovakia split, and that's the Slovakian part. And they have both rivers and they have hydroelectric power. Now let me tell you what happened in Kuwait. Now this is before I was hired. But in Kuwait, they have no rivers. They have no lakes. They have no hydroelectric power. Students have often, that were interviewed, had often never seen a river or a lake. Now we're talking what I would call a cultural difference of a fairly significant. They actually changed it that this, they were going to be trying to getting water power from the ocean, and this was an ocean-going fish, because they are on the ocean, and I don't know if you can get hydroelectric power from the ocean. I mean, I assume there are tides and things, but that's, I know what I know and don't know, and I don't know if you can do that. Uh, and it was, a, it was now a seagoing fish that was endangered, which you would think it could swim away and go somewhere else. But, but nevertheless, now we're starting to talk about a problem that just doesn't fit that easily. Now, 
Mexico had already developed a Spanish version. But one of the things, I was chair of the board for the graduate record exam, and we wanted to build a Spanish graduate record exam. Uh, and what we found out is you need at least three different versions, that Spanish is variable enough across countries that you can't get by with one Spanish version test. There are specific words and, and statements that are used. So we had to go into Colombia and do a different version, and they basically rejected the Mexican version and said it wasn't very good for their country. So we did a whole different Spanish version. So that just, I'm just trying to show some differences that you run into, and it makes some of my points, I think, really clearly. Now then let's talk about South Korea. They thought they had done a great job. I met with the person uh, who was in charge of that team, and they thought they had a great translation. And yet, um, the statistics were just horrible. I mean, the pretest statistics just didn't work at all. Now, it just so happened that year, I had both a new graduate student from Korea who had a master's in English already. I mean, actually, it was in education, but it was in teaching, um, teaching English as a foreign language. And she had taught English in Korea for like seven years before coming back to graduate school in the United States. Uh, she's now graduated, by the way. And, and so she. I asked her to look at it. I had hired her as an assistant, so I asked her to look at it. And she says it doesn't make any sense. In Korea, the government supplies all the power. There are no such things as power companies. It do, there's no profit motive. It's, it's apparently distributed at cost to people. So it just didn't make sense at all. So we changed it. Is that the next slide? Yeah. So we rewrote the scenario to focus on the power being supplied by the government. And the test taker was now not a uh, consultant to the, to the company, but to the government. And there were a few other minor issues changed. And then we had it pre-tested again, and it worked fine. So that little difference of working for a company versus working for the government made it nonsensical for the people of South Korea. Now then we get to the one that's my favorite, and I did this one in Egypt. Uh, and I will tell you, I have built fire exams in New York City, and I've gone into burning buildings. I have built police exams, and I've, I've uh, in two different cities. I've never been in a gunfight, but I have had guns pulled where I've been there. I've worn, you know, bulletproof vests while I'm riding around watching police officers do their job. I don't get scared real easily. But I did this in the middle of the revolution in, in Egypt. And there was gunfire in the background. There was, uh, I stayed in the Marriott, which is where all the press was staying, and where the former president's family was staying. To get into there, you had to, they had pylons that came up out of the road, and you had to open the taxi doors, and they had sniffer dogs. To get into the hotel, it was like getting onto an airplane. You know, you had to go through a medical detector. Uh, on my floor, which is where the, the family of the former president was staying, there were guards with guns as you got off the elevator. So this was not like a relaxing, pleasant. I actually had a view of the Nile from my room, and it, I didn't want to leave the room, you know. I mean, uh, however, uh, they said there are differences in Arabic between what they call Gulf Arabic and modern standard Arabic, which is what's uh, used in Egypt. Uh, uh, I do some work in, in, uh, in, the, Middle East, uh, in the Middle East, and, and so I've been there a fair amount, but uh, I don't speak any Arabic at all. I've tried to learn the number system just for prices and stuff, but that's it. And, and so we had to do those adaptations. Now, certainly they know rivers and lakes. The Nile is there, after all. It's a, it's a river of some consequence. We actually had some data that didn't look very good, so we watched them actually test two people using this uh, and then be interviewed. Uh, now, that was all in Arabic, so they had to translate it for us later. But when they got right down to it, what they, the, the faculty members told us is that no governmental agency in Egypt would ever hire a consultant who was a layperson. 
They do not trust anybody outside the government, and they would not ask you, what could we do different? And so that, and that was such an issue that they said they simply couldn't go forward with it. So we asked them to come up with another solution, and ultimately they moved it to America. They said this was two lakes and two rivers, uh, two lakes and a river and fish in America, and that they as Egyptians had been hired as the consultant to come into America to give us advice. And that actually worked pretty well. Now, the point of my going through those questions is to show you how much difference there has to be in a problem that's a simple problem that had been pre-approved as one that would be culturally adaptable. And I also want to say, I'm not picking on performance assessments and saying, gee, multiple choice items are great. In multiple choice items, it's just hidden a little better. Okay? Now, I'm all for taking, and, and I gave a similar talk to this to a group of psychologists in America not long ago, and one of the people asked, so you're saying we shouldn't really be doing this? And I said, no, I don't think that's true at all. I just think we have to be careful about making international comparisons. Now, can you imagine that they actually have done international comparisons on these questions? But it's not exactly the same question in each case. It's quite different. And some of them might be easier and some of them may be harder. And we don't really know um, how that is. Uh, so I, th I think it can be very useful to do this. I think critical thinking is one of the most important things for people to learn. I say that as a former dean and so forth. I think we want people who can think through problems carefully and well. And that should be one of the most important parts of higher education. But when we start doing international comparisons, we have to be very careful. I didn't put it, and just to make the point about multiple choice, I didn't put this in the slide. But there's a question on the fourth grade PISA, which is the science test that's given internationally. There's a question that, say, that says, again, fourth grade science, why do ducks swim so well? Okay. The right answer in English, and this, these were done at the same time, remember, this is, they're all done, the adaptations are done, translations are done at the same time. The right answer in English is because they have webbed feet. Now, in the country comparisons, Finland, by the way, seems to do very well on most of the country comparisons for some reason. But on that particular question, the Swedish kids did by far the best. And the reason is, webbed feet translates in Swedish to swimming feet. Now that makes the question a whole lot easier. You know, why do ducks swim so well? Because they have swimming feet. We have a joke in, in, Engl in America of who's buried in Grant's tomb. That's one of our former presidents, William Grant. So, I mean, it makes it very, very different. Uh, okay, I told that already. So, a few general comments. Uh, I, I'm concluding here, I think, pretty soon. Uh, many measures presume that the original scales validation research uh, in, the, and in the original language and culture generalized to a new culture. I, I edited a book for a publisher um, that was written by one of the authors of the MMPI who was arguing we don't need to do validation research on the MMPI when it's taken from different, into different cultures. And what he did is he had two Spanish-speaking countries where it seemed to work pretty well and they had done validation research. And so he was saying it works in the United States, it works in these two other countries, so we can take it anywhere. Well, that's a generalization I'm not willing to make. Um, some, scale, some scales even use the original norms from English in other languages, which is really very scary to me. Um, okay, so a few lessons that I've learned from OECD and PISA, um, that you need a, a national expert committee to review the content and appropriateness of translated material, um, thinking about culture, social structures, traditions, geography, and, and even the educational experience of students. Um, there's a, a technique that's now being talked about of double translation with ex extensive cross-checks, and here you actually have two independent teams translate the test, and then you have people look at both translations to see what seems to work best as a way, as, it's sort of like a cross-validation. Uh, and then you have this reconciliation 
uh, where you, you bring together your results um, from those two translations. Um, what we found, I think, the fidelity of translations depends on protocols, cultures, training, economic climate, uh, the educational context, and a whole variety of, uh, of other schema. Uh, context measures matters, and one of the things, you're supposed to have random samples in any of these international comparisons, but in some countries it does not appear that people are doing it randomly. And there are some countries, in the United States right now, 60 to 70 percent of kids go to college. I don't know what the percentage is, is here in Hong Kong. Anybody? No? Forty? Four. Forty? See, that's going to make it much more selective. When I studied in Germany back in 1970 and 71, it was only about 25 percent went to university. Now it's much higher. But they've also differentiated universities. And so if you're doing comparisons, for example, of college students, and there are different levels of selectivity, that's going to influence the results too. Uh, and the different things are taught at different grades in different educational systems. God bless you. Twice. Uh, and so these are things we have to take into account. Uh, I think adapted measures do have huge appeal and potential. We need to do more research on this. I actually think in countries other than the United States, these could be great studies for students to do, to adapt measures and validate them and find out if they're going to be useful in your culture. They do need to be thoroughly reviewed. It's, it's not a one-person project. This has to be team projects. And what we're learning in, in science is that we need team projects for lots of things. Few issues in international test adaptation that the nature and complexity of the process of adapting a measure from one language to another is indeed difficult and complex. That basic processes help ensure that the cultural validity of a measure that is taken from one language and culture to another needs to be considered. Basic psychometric concerns need to be looked at to ensure that the adapted measure is valid in the target language and culture and that we should have cautions in the use of translated measures, especially with immigrant populations or with international clients. And with that, I thank you. <laughs>